thank you all for coming tonight. This is the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award Fireside Chat. So if you're wondering why there's no fire, you're, you are in the right place. Um, we stuck it outside for safety reasons. Um, so I'm, my name is Mark Lusbrink. I am a member of the subcommittee for the Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, as well as an advisor to the Environmental Law Section Executive Committee. Marilee Hansen uh, is also an advisor to the Executive Committee and a member of the subcommittee. And Ellen Peter, to my right, is the chair of the Lifetime Achievement Award subcommittee. Um, I imagine some of you may not be privy to the history of the Lifetime Achievement Award. This is actually the sixth year. It started, uh, the planning started back in 2012 and 2013. And in 2014, the inaugural award was given to Joe Sachs posthumously. So it's, and um, if any of you ever want to know about the folks I'm going to mention, we have bios on all of them on our website. Um, our subsequent winners, the first year we did not have a fireside chat because it was given posthumously, but we've had the fireside chat for the subsequent years. Uh, the second year we give it to Clem Shute, the third year to Johanna Wald from NRDC, uh, the fourth year Byron Chair, who was a professor at Stanford and also was many years in the California legislature. Um, last year it was given to Mary Nichols, who is the chair of the California Air Resources Board and had many other uh, activities prior to that with uh, various activities for clean air. And this year we are very excited to give it to Michael Sherwood. So um, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the criteria for the award, but I do wanna say a few things because uh, I think they're really important when you think about the winners. Um, we spent, and Marilee and I were heavily involved back before the award was started, thinking a lot and talking a lot and debating what, what, what a winner should, should do, you know, what qualities they should have. And there's a list of the criteria on the nomination form, and they would include the kind of things you would expect, you know, great lawyer, innovative strategies, you know, they won all their cases, yada, yada, yada. Um, but we really thought that they, there were other factors that we wanted to see. And I will just note, it, note two of them, because I think they've been the ones that we've, at least for me, have stood out most clearly for the winners of the award, and that is that our winners have practiced law with ethics and integrity. And we really wanted to see winners who have spent their career um, not just being adversarial, though sometimes they have to be, but could be polite, diplomatic, had kindness, all those other characters, characteristics that lawyers are not always known for and that we believe should be more prevalent. So those have been um, really all of our award winners. I think if there's one thing that's come across, it's that they're great people, or at least they appear to be great people. So, um, so let's see. Um, I would be remiss here, and I almost jumped past this. Um, this event, I did not put up all this equipment, and I did not set up the stage or the seats or plan all this. Um, we have incredible staff. We have a new, um, for our environmental law, law section, Julia Bird is our new section coordinator. Julia, are you in the room today? She's not. She's running the next event. She's running the next event. If you see her, say thank you. She's been wonderful. She's, it's her first year, but she's stepped in and been incredible. And Christina Robledo is, has our, was our prior section coordinator. She is out helping people find the right room since we switched locations this year from last year. So she's hovering around and, and finding folks and making sure they don't get lost. And they have been incredibly um, helpful and done a tremendous job. And I'm gonna thank our videographer, who's my favorite videographer on the planet and does an awesome job, and he's a great guy. It's Scott Hester. So Scott, can you just wave to folks? And, um, so thank you, Scott, and thank you, Julia and Christina. And thank you all for coming. We're excited for the, the chat. It's always a, a, a treat. It's one of my favorite things all year. Um, before we turn to the, the discussion um, between Tom and Michael, I think Ellen would like to say just a few words about Michael's career before we launch. So actually, I wanted the main thing I wanted to do is um, give you kind of the run of what we're going to do right now. So Tom is going to do the interview. We're going to do that for about um, 30 minutes. 
take a few questions from the audience. Uh, if anybody has any questions, we'll end a little 6.15, 6.20, somewhere along there. Um, this is the interview part. The actual award is going to be given to Mike at the dinner. And so um, starting at 6.15, there's uh, free drinks and hors d'oeuvres in the lobby. The dinner starts at about 7 o'clock. And that's when Mike will actually get the award, which we haven't even told him what it is yet. But that will be, and Andrea Trek from, from Earth Justice is going to introduce him at the dinner. So that's kind of how this all uh, plays out. Um, I actually didn't practice uh, with or against uh, Mike uh, during his career. But um, in terms of what he did, um, people kept talking about how he was just like such a nice guy and he was such a mentor and so inclusive. So that was one of the reasons he was the unanimous nominee for, from the subcommittee and then by the executive um, committee to select him as the sixth Lifetime Achievement Award. So thank you very much and Tom, we'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all. <coughs> Uh, thank you all for coming. I've heard it said before, I am not a lawyer, I will tell you that right off the, the bat, that, that, but that a good lawyer when he's questioning a witness won't ask any questions that he doesn't know the answer to. Well, I'm breaking that rule tonight. I don't know the answer to all these questions. We've batted some questions back and forth, but we have not rehearsed. So let's start with the nuts and bolts. Why, why did you become a lawyer and when did you decide? Um, before I answer that, can I just say for those sure. of you who don't know who Tom is, Tom Turner, um, he was a staff writer for Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund for years and then Earth Justice and before that for Friends of the Earth. Um, he's an acclaimed environmental writer written uh, Definitive History of the Sierra Club, books on Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, Earth Justice, uh, The Roadless Rule, right? Roadless Rule. <clears throat> and most recently, a biography of David Brower. So. Thank you. And, oh, and I should say that we've known each other. <laughs> See, this is we've, an example of him being nice. We've been colleagues and friends for almost 40 years. Oh, okay, so how did I, what was the question? Again? Back to the, how'd you get here? <laughs> um, how, did I, how did I become a lawyer? And why, and when why? did you decide? Well, you know, when I went to undergraduate school at Yale, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And um, so when I graduated, <clears throat> I still had no idea what I wanted to do, so I thought, well, I'll just keep going to school. So then the choice was business school or law school, and I took the uh, entrance exams for both, and I found the business school exam just really boring. Um, but the law school exam was, was kind of interesting, so that was what made me decide to go to law school. Um, I still had no idea if I wanted to really be a lawyer, though. Um, most of the courses that went to Stanford Law School, most of the courses were sort of commercial and business oriented, and it just, which I had no interest in at all. But my, one of my, my favorite course at law school was a clinical semester uh, in the Legal Aid Society in, in East Palo Alto. And so I really enjoyed that, and that kind of gave me the first taste of using the law to help people who needed help. Um, so when I graduated, I went to Hawaii, which is why I'm wearing this. Um, and my first job in Hawaii with, was with the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. And then from there, I went to the US Attorney's Office for three years, and then in private practice for two years. And then uh, the job with what was then the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund came along and I stayed with them for the next 39 years. 
when you started practicing law, first in Hawaii and then in San Francisco and thereabouts, there were only a few brand new statutes to work with, am I right? The Endangered True. Species Act was new and the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, so with so little established law to draw on <clears throat> to, to cite and so forth, how did you, how did you construct your, your litigation, your, your lawsuits? Yeah, well, that's right. I started, my first year of practice was 1968 in Hawaii. And most of the environmental laws that we have on the books now were, didn't exist. Um, most of them were passed starting in 1970. So, um, in my, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney in Hawaii, I had two cases that kind of turned me on to the, the law and the environment. Uh, one was with the, uh, when the Coast Guard came to me in the U.S. Attorney's Office and they wanted us to do something about ships that were dumping their garbage and oil into Honolulu Harbor. Um, and this was before the Clean Water Act, it was before there was even an uh, Environmental Protection Agency. So I researched the law and I found this nifty little um, law called the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. Um, and sections, I won't get too far into the weeds here, but <laughs> sections nine and 10 of that act prohibited the uh, putting obstructions into the navigable waters of the United States. And that law really mostly dealt with dams and such things, but I figured, well, maybe we could make an argument that an, uh, pollution, water pollution is an obstruction. So I figured, what the hell, we'll try it. And uh, <clears throat> so it was a misdemeanor, <clears throat> excuse me, so I prepared a, uh, an information um, against the shipping companies and they actually pled guilty. So. We never got a court ruling as to whether that use of the Rivers and Harbors Act was appropriate. But we did get some publicity out of it, which is really what the Coast Guard wanted. And um, so it, the word got out that if you're going to dump, don't dump your garbage into Honolulu Harbor. And if you do, and if you get caught, there will be legal consequences. So we managed to clean up the harbor pretty well with that. The other case, came to me from the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which operated um, a wildlife refuge in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which is a string of islands that extends about a thousand miles to the northwest of the main inhabited islands of Hawaii. And it was a wildlife refuge not open to the public. And so the, the refuge manager, who was a guy named Gene Kreidler, came to see me and he'd been coming to uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office for years and had been ignored. But he wanted us to do something about um, boat people and fishermen who were going ashore onto the islands to collect um, Japanese uh, glass fishing balls that would wash up onto the beaches. And <clears throat> he explained to me that uh, the refuge was the habitat for endangered Hawaiian monk seals and endangered uh, sea turtles. And that the problem with people going on shore was that they would, could disturb these animals <clears throat> and they could also uh, introduce non-native critters onto the island, rats from the boats, or they could track in seeds of invasive plants from the mud on their shoes and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, as I say, and there wasn't any Endangered Species Act at this time either. So I looked up the law on trespassing on United States property. Again, a misdemeanor. So again, I prepared an information. We filed that with the court. Again, they really had no defense, so they pled guilty. 
we got a fine, we got a front page uh, publicity in the local Honolulu newspaper. And again, Gene Kreidler, the refuge manager, was that's really what he wanted. Um, so the word went out that the refuge is off limits to the public, and if you trespass and get caught, um, you'll be fined. So just one other little anecdote. Gene was, they were so happy that someone in the US Attorney's Office had finally taken their cases seriously that he invited me to go along <clears throat> with him and another biologist out to the refuge on one of their periodic trips to uh, just to inspect the, the animals and the birds. And so it took me about a half a second, I think, to say, yes, sir. So we flew out on a military transport plane out to uh, Midway Island. And from there, military helicopter out to a tiny little island called Pearl and Hermes Reef. And the helicopter went away, and we lived in tents on this island for two weeks, and I helped the biologists uh, weighing the turtles and tagging them and um, looking at the monk seals, making sure they were okay, doing bird counts. And uh, one of, really one of the highlights of my uh, career, and that was what led me to, um, well, that showed me how the law could be used to help wildlife and, and especially endangered species. Well, to follow up on that, the Endangered Species Act <clears throat> was passed and signed in 73 or 74. 1973, yeah. 73, and it forbade um, harming listed species. Right. But it didn't say anything about their habitat, which can be key to all these problems. Yep. So tell us the story about the palila a little bit, will you please? The Palila bird, yeah. Um, one of my favorite cases, probably my favorite case, just in terms of fun. Um, so about 19, I can't even remember. Now, it was actually after I took the job with the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund in San Francisco. So probably about 1974 or five, just a year or two after the Endangered Species Act was enacted. Um, Dr. Alan Ziegler, who was the head of the vertebrate zoology department of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, called me and said, there's this bird called the palila, which is endemic to the Hawaiian Islands, it exists nowhere else in the world, that's um, going extinct. Um, and what can we do about it? And he explained to me that the palila had um, evolved with the native Hawaiian forest there. And it had um, evolved, for example, a specially sort of designed beak to crack open the seed pods of the, the native trees. So the bird needed this habitat for its survival. It couldn't live anywhere else. And the problem was that there were sheep and goats that were introduced into the habitat by the state Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources for sport hunters. And the plants, the native plants, had not evolved any defenses to grazing or browsing by animals, such as thorns or um, um, poisonous sap or bitter tasting bark. So there, the biologists called these plants ice cream plants for the sheep and the goats. And they just went nuts and they were, they'd get up on their hind legs and eat all the leaves off the lower branches of the mature trees, which would kill them. And then they would eat the seedlings of the young trees down to the ground. So there were new, no new trees coming in. And uh, so as the habitat was vanishing, the birds were um, declining. So um, I researched the law, it was brand new. Um, section seven of the law prohibits um, federal agencies from doing anything that 
would jeopardize or harm species. But there's no federal agency action here, so that didn't apply. Section 9 prohibited any person, quote unquote, from taking, quote unquote, uh, a list, any listed species, threatened or endangered species. So we had to argue that the state of Hawaii was a person within the meaning of the law and that the habitat destruction that was being caused by the sheep and the goats was a taking within the meaning of the law, even though the birds themselves weren't being directly killed. There weren't you know, bodies lying on the, on the ground. Um, so we went for it. We had a very creative judge, federal judge in Hawaii, Judge Sam King. And um, he agreed with us. Um, he wrote us a wonderful decision. He disposed of a couple of preliminary issues, such as um, that the state did not have immunity under the 11th Amendment and that the Endangered Species Act was constitutional even though it, even as it applied to a species that was contained within the confines of a single state, as was the case here. And then he ruled that yes, um, habitat degradation can constitute a take and that the, Hawaii, the state of Hawaii by maintaining these animals in the birds' critical habitat were taking the palila and he ordered the state to uh, eradicate the sheep and the goats, which they finally did after some years and af only after I had to threaten to hold the governor of the state of Hawaii in contempt of court. <laughs> because they, at first they refused to comply with the order. They said the federal can't, the court can't order us around. But Judge King said when, when we had the contempt hearing, Judge King said, well, I can either, you can either comply with my order and we can all go home, or you can, uh, I can send you to jail, <laughs> and or I can take over the administration of the, the, uh, the Department of Land and Nature, uh, Nat Natural Resources, the way the federal courts in the South had taken over the administration of the public schools during the desegregation area era. So the state got the message and they, they finally agreed. Um, there was another whole round of litigation about another a different species of sheep with the same result. The state appealed both cases to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which affirmed in both cases. Um, and then we had another round of litigation about attorney's fees, which the court awarded. So that one case resulted in about five officially re uh, reported decisions, uh, which made a lot of new law and became legal precedent. Um, so anyway, that was that case. And oh, did I mention that we uh, decided to name the Palila itself as the lead plaintiff in the case? Just just for fun. So the case is known as the Palila, an endangered species, and then with the Latin name versus the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. And um, Alan, Dr. Ziegler, had a stuffed Palila that he kept in the Bishop Museum. And I asked him to bring it to court with him. And so I had the... <laughs> I had the stuffed palila in court on the council table right next to me where, <laughs> where my client would, would normally sit during the trial. And the judge got a kick out of that. He said, bring that up here. I want to take a look at it. So, so. Um, I've come to realize that science plays a big part in much of your career and much of your litigation, the Palila and salmon cases that we could talk to talk about until tomorrow morning if we had the time. Yep. <clears throat> um, it must have been a, a bit of a challenge though sometimes if 
the experts that you used sometimes as clients, I guess, and often as experts. Mm -hmm. um, what if all the experts worked for the defendant, worked for the federal government, and you were trying to get some relief from what the agencies were doing? Um, well, that did occasionally happen. Um, in the Palila case, I had sick, well, Dr. Ziegler, of course, was a PhD invertebrate zoologist, but I also had six experts, um, every expert really in the world on the bird, the native vegetation, and the sheep, and how they all interacted. And uh, one of them, Dr. Charles, Charlie Van Riper, for example, lived in a tent on the slopes of Mauna Kea for two years studying the, the bird. And so he knew, knew more about the bird than anyone in, in the world. And uh, I spent a glorious day four-wheel driving around the slopes of Mauna Kea with those six guys. Uh, while they educated me on the biology of the bird and the plants and the sheep and the goats so that I could ask intelligent questions when the time came in court. And then I educated them about the, what was going to happen in court. Um, so that was very rewarding. But, uh, and they were, most of those six were, did work for the federal government. They were federal employees, but the federal government was not a defendant in that case, so that was okay. But I did have a case involving Hawaiian monk seals in which um, the main biology, the expert, was a government employee. And that was a case where I think it was Greenpeace of Hawaii came to me and said that the monk seals, the, the National Marine Fishery Service, which is the agency that deals with marine mammals, um, and critters um, was had failed to designate critical habitat for the monk seal, as had been recommended by the Marine Mammals Commission and the Hawaiian monk seal recovery team. Um, so, as part of my investigation of the case, I met and interviewed the head of the recovery team. It was a guy named Bill Gilmartin. Um, a NIMPS uh, career marine biologist and uh, asked him about the case and he said, yes, our recommendation is that they have to designate critical habitat in order for the seal to recover. So we filed the suit and um, NIMPS did designate out to a, a depth of 10 fathoms around the area where the monk seal uh, lived. Um, but Gil Martin and the Marine Mammal Commission had said, no, it's got to be up to 20 fathoms. And it made a huge difference um, between 20 fathoms and 10 fathoms, about 3,000 square miles of ocean surface. So the government had asked me to dismiss the suit once they designated the case of the critical habitat to 10 fathoms. And I said, no, I'm not, not only am I not going to dismiss it, I'm going to file an amended complaint that you need to designate that to 20 fathoms. And I went back to Bill Gilmartin and I said, would you be willing to testify about this? And of course, he was very articulate, very ardent about the need to do this. And he said, sure, if you subpoena me. So I called the Justice Department lawyer and said, I'm going to sked, I want to notice Bill's deposition and, uh, and uh, I may ask him, may call him to testify if necessary. About two days after that, she called me back and said, uh, NIMS has decided to designate that to 20 fathoms. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was just the threat of their own expert witness being called to testify against them that made them basically fold up their tents and go home. I gather you had any number of instances where there were, we're talking this week, might have been called whistleblowers. You had agency scientists who would quietly suggest. Yeah, quite often that was how we would find out about cases. A, a scientist 
some government scientists would call and say, uh, you can't ever tell anyone who you heard this from, but you might want to know that, you know, and, and that would lead us to, um, yeah, some case. That happened quite frequently. I'd love to talk about salmon for an hour or two, but we don't have that. So let me ask you about one, one case that uh, a friend of ours helped you on uh, about a dam on the Rogue River that was interfering with salmon mm -hmm. migration, right? Yeah, called the Savage Rapids Dam. Um, yeah, we did just a little background about the salmon for about the, I think the last 25 years of my um, tenure at Earth Justice, I was dealing with salmon issues, which in turn got me involved in the water wars in California and the operation of the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project and the pumps and, and all that. And we were very contentious. And, um, but the campaign began with trying to get the, one of the runs in the Sacramento River um, of salmon, the winter run Chinook salmon run listed as an endangered species, which we did. Uh, and then we ended up filing a series of lawsuits that got something like 21 species of salmon and steelhead up and down the coast of the west coast, um, Washington State, Oregon, California, listed. And once we got them listed, then the Endangered Species Act came into play, very, probably the most powerful um, legal environmental weapon that we have. Um, and so one of the results of that was that the operators, the, the federal government sued the operators of the Savage Rapids Dam on the Rogue River in Oregon, <coughs> um, saying that they were, the operation of the dam was taking the salmon, which are now listed, because they couldn't get access to their um, spawning grounds up on the Rogue River and the tributaries to the Rogue River. And so we intervened on the side of the government in that case, and uh, we entered into settlement negotiations, and my colleague, Claudia Polsky, I don't know if she's here, I hope she is. <laughs> Hi, Claudia. <laughs> um, did yeoman work in the negotiation, did almost virtually all the negotiations, which led to the, ultimately, to the removal of the Savage Rapid Stand. Um, and when was that, in 19? I left, I left you with the case in, I think, about 1999? Yeah, the late 1990s, I guess. And um, it wasn't just as easy as pulling a switch and the dam was gone. They had to do an environmental impact statement because of all the sediment for years that built up behind the dam. And you know, so they had to <coughs> figure out what the impact of that was going to be when it was released down the dam. But finally, it was taken down. And in celebration of that event, all of the interested parties, the clients, me, Claudia, I think, I hope, was there. Um, um, we had a flotilla of kayaks and rafts and other canoes and other kinds of boats floating down the river past where, where, what used to be the Savage Rapids Dam. Uh, and then we had a big party that night after <laughs> that. <laughs> good, good. Well, we're, we're starting to run time. out of time, but um, well, a sort of standard closing question. Do you have advice for practicing lawyers or young lawyers just headed into the field? Any, any suggestions for them? Well, yeah, if you're still in law school, of course, you want to take all the environmental law courses that you can. And, and, and maybe also administrative law, because many of, of our lawsuits are against the federal government which should be enforcing the environmental laws that we have, but often doesn't and especially isn't now a days. 
So a lot of the suits are against the government for failing to follow the right process or making decisions that are arbitrary and capricious. And that all falls under the rubric of the Administrative Procedure Act, so it's good to know something about that. And then I would say, during, if you can get summer internship jobs at um, Earth Justice or Natural Resources Defense Council or the Environmental Defense Fund or the Sierra Club, which all of which have legal departments, um, you know that would help. Um, and then when you're at a law school, of course, try to get a paid clerkship with any of those organizations um, if you can. Um, and I guess I would also say try to get trial work experience as soon as you can. Um, working for you know public defender's office or prosecuting attorney's office or the attorney general or the U.S. attorney's office. Um, that'll give you good courtroom experience, which is good to have and also looks good on your resume. Because when I was interviewing possible candidates at Earth Justice for, for positions, we were usually looking not for someone fresh out of law school, but um, someone who had two or three years of experience under their belts. Um, and what else? And I would say, um, yeah, I guess that would be my advice. Okay. <clears throat> Well, you've got quite some stories to tell. Have you written these down in a place that people can get access to? Um, I don't know about getting access to it, but yeah, I did. <laughs> <In> fact, <coughs> one, of, one of the things that I did when I retired was I spent about a year, you know, just an hour at a time, writing uh, kind of a memoir of my career highlights, um, which, um, if, which has citations to all of the cases that I've mentioned here and others. And, um, so if anyone is interested in that, I can, I'm not sure I can make it available, but it might be, it might be up on the website. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's on the app, yeah. And it's, it's called um, Reflections of a, of, an environmental lawyer, or some, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> some such. Yeah. Well, one more thing. You wanted to talk, I mean, we could go on for hours, as I've said repeatedly, but <clears throat> you said you wanted to talk and remember a little bit about a case where you were brought in to help a matter having uh, to do at Cape Cod. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to, I, I, this is a good one. Um, wasn't even my case. It was a case brought by Doug Foy, who was then the head of the Conservation Law Foundation in Boston. And he had brought a lawsuit in federal court against the National Park Service to try to get them to stop allowing off-road um, dune buggy use on the sand dunes in Cape Cod National Seashore. Um, which was established to protect the national, the natural beauty of the area. And these dune buggies were just ripping up the sand dunes. Um, so he had the brilliant idea of asking the, uh, the renowned photographer, nat nature photographer, Ansel Adams, to be a witness in that case. Um, but Ansel was getting on in years at the time and lived in California, so he could not very easily uh, get to the East Coast. So Doug called me up and asked me if I would um, <coughs> take his deposition for use in the trial back East. So that took me about another half a second <laughs> to say, yes, sir. Um, so I scheduled his deposition to be taken in the living room of his house in Carmel, California. And <clears throat> on the appointed day, the assistant U.S. attorney from San Francisco, the court reporter, and I all showed up. My wife, Kathy, came along to meet the great man. Um, 
And we all sat in his living room uh, overlooking the Pacific Ocean in this gorgeous house. Took his deposition for a couple of hours while his lovely wife, Virginia, I think her name was. Virginia Best, yes. Served us tea. <coughs> and after the deposition, he gave us a, a tour of his dark rooms and signed some of his uh, books of photography for us. And uh, anyway, and so Doug actually used the deposition, and I think they, I think the government decided to settle. The, the gist of Ansel's uh, testimony was, as you might expect, that the dune buggies were a travesty and were destroying the very scenic values that the seashore was established to protect. Um, so with that deposition in hand, Doug managed to settle the case and there aren't any dune buggies anymore at Cape Cod National Seashore. And uh, Ansel seemed pretty sharp while we were taking his deposition, but he died about four months afterwards. So another highlight of my career. <laughs> Not that he died, but that we... <laughs> 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 we got to meet him and yes. spend some time with him and his beautiful So, place. Mark, were you going to, yeah. Uh, so, I think we're coming t close to the end of our, our time, but I wanted to, we oftentimes have members of the audience who've got questions, and I think we've got time for mm -hmm. at least one or maybe two. So, if anybody has a question they would like to ask, I can bring them the mic. Yes, ma'am. Hold on a sec. Let me give you the mic if you don't mind. So we can get it for the. Hi, I I'm just curious. How did you ever um, decide to live in Hawaii? I didn't hear the the rest of the. How did I develop what? No. How did you decide to live in Hawaii? You went to school at Yale, uh, then Stanford Law School, and then from there went to Hawaii. I can't hear the question. Can oh, someone? How did you? Why did I go to Hawaii in the first place? Um, because after my, well, I, I was born and raised in the East Coast in Connecticut, went to Yale, um, got into two law schools, Columbia and Stanford, and I came out to Stanford because I just felt I wanted to see some other part of the country. And then it just sort of felt like the natural thing to keep going west. <laughs> <laughs> And in my second, after my first year of law school, I got a clerkship in a, with a law firm in Hawaii. So that was my introduction. I met a lot of people there. And, um, and I, before I moved to Hawaii, I got a job with Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. So I had a job waiting for me when I went. And uh, yeah, that's why. And I spent the first seven years of my legal career there. Still have a lot of friends there. <coughs> Two of my friends um, sent me this lay, which arrived about three hours ago from Hawaii. <laughs> All right, anyone else with Any a question? More? I, I have one, if, uh, if no one else does. Yep. Um, I don't know the year, I think 83, 84, when the condor population was probably in the 40. I, I don't know all the numbers, but um, having read a little bit and know something about it, even though I was young, it seems like that was a pretty controversial time yes, for endangered species. Yeah. How, how, do you, how did you feel? I mean, how, what, what were your views at that time as to what we should have done, meaning the state or whoever we were, U.S. Fish and Wildlife? Yeah, well, um, you're right. The condor really was on the brink of extinction at one point. I think they were down to, you probably know this, <clears throat> 20, just a handful of birds, 23 <clears throat> birds in the wild. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so the Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to capture the remaining birds in the wild, bring them into a captive breeding population before they went extinct in the wild. And then the idea would be to <clears throat> breed up the population and then release them again back into the wild. Very controversial idea. David Brower, 
about whom uh, Tom wrote a book um, was very much opposed to it. Yes. I think, and Friends of the Earth was opposed to it. And their attitude was, we shouldn't interfere with nature. We should just let the birds be. And if they go extinct, then so be it. Um, other environmental groups like Audubon Society and I think Sierra Club and, and, and I personally were very much opposed to that idea um, because the reason they were so endangered was because of human activity. And so my feeling was if it's human activity that's about to drive them extinct, then you know, we owe it to them to try to save them. Um, so, and of course, uh, I was with what was then the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, and we represented all these groups, you know, Friends of the Earth, Audubon, Sierra Club. And so we, I was caught in the middle of a conflict of interest, and the, the Brower um, and his group asked us to represent them. <laughs> and the Sierra Club wanted us to me to represent them, and I just wrote them all. I said, I, I, I can't represent any of you because, uh, you know, it's a total conflict. Um, and I did write a long letter to, I think, I um, can't remember the name of the guy who was the head of the Audubon Society at that point, and explained why I couldn't represent them and why I personally felt that the birds should be captured. Um, and anyway, the, the end result was that they did capture the last remaining birds, and um, it was a fairly successful captive breeding population. And there now are several captive breeding populations in different locations, and they do it that way so that if there's some disease that hits one captive population and wipes it out, there will be others. And there are a total of, um, I don't know, there are several hundred birds now flying in the wild. And they've had condors nesting and breeding in the wild now. And there's some in the, the Grand Canyon. There's some down in Pinnacles National Park. Um, so, I mean, the bird is hardly out of the woods yet, so to speak. but. Um, uh, they did manage to <coughs> stave off extinction, and at least it's got a fighting chance now. So yeah. I think I think that was the right thing to do. Agreed. Because it probably would be extinct now if we'd yeah. gone the other way. If I could add a little bit, yeah. um, Dave's position wasn't quite as cold-hearted as as <laughs> you put it there. <laughs> The, um, his argument was that the condors were in terrible danger <clears throat> because, as you say, of human activities because of loss of habitat. And their argument was that if, they, if the condors all get captured, then, then there's even less impetus to protect the habitat. And uh -huh. once you let them out from captive breeding, they're going to have nowhere to go. Well, I think that wasn't right, but it, uh -huh. they didn't say we should keep hands off and just let nature take its course. They certainly agreed that it was human activities that were threatening yeah. the condors. Right. Yeah. And one of the, the threats to the condor now, of course, is loss of habitat, but another big one is <clears throat> lead poisoning. Um, hunters use lead bullets to shoot whatever they're shooting although that's outlawed in California now. I think uh, no more lead bullets. But then the condors come and scavenge the carcass and get the, the lead poisoning. So whenever they find a dead condor now, they do an autopsy and they, they uh, you know, check the blood samples to, to see what the, the lead level is. So. I wanted to thank both of you for uh, doing the interviewer, the interviewee. This has been just absolutely fabulous. Um, I'd like the audience to have an opportunity to give you a round of applause for both your career and your outstanding interview.
So thank you very much. And for those of you who have uh, tickets for the dinner, it starts about seven. And between now and then there are um, uh, complimentary uh, drinks and hors d'oeuvres in the lobby. So thank you very much for joining us today. And once again, thanks so much to you, Mike, for your absolutely fabulous career and all the things that you've done for us. Well, thank you.